So let's start. Let's start with the the your name, um, mm-hmm. not your given name, but if we had hate copy, tell tell me where does hate copy come from? So yeah. I used to work in advertising as a copywriter. Um, what kind of stuff? Like I worked for a beer brand for like two years, um, which is funny because it's like a brand that was marketed to like frat bros, and <laughs> there was n- me, Natty Light. No, it was like a it was like a posh beer, but kind of like a posh beer brand. I don't know. Right. I didn't drink beer at the time, so it didn't really matter to me. But yeah, I worked for them for two years, and then um, just bouncing from like agencies to agencies. Like I did some stuff for like Tim Hortons. What did you hate about it? Because um, I figured that's it. Hate, hate copy. You hate copy. Yeah, writing. yeah. Essentially, yeah. Um, the thing is, the artwork started taking off before I could change the name or figure out. Like people were looking at my stuff and going, oh yeah, that's a hate copy piece. And I was like, oh, I guess that's like my identity. That's my brand now. So I should just stick with it. I didn't really hate anything about copywriting, just like didn't really plan to be that. So I was promoting myself as a copywriter who didn't really care about the copywriting, but cared more about like the idea or the bigger picture. The art, the art of it. Yeah. What was, what was the turning point where you were like, no, I'm, I'm done. I'm done with I'm done with this side of things. I'm just going to work on my own art. I think I was just having a lot of fun with it. Like I was just like the idea that anything that I create and put out there had my name on it and it didn't go through like 20, 30 people before it became, you know, a thing or before anybody else saw it. Um which is 100% the case in advertising. So if you work in if you work on an idea, if you work on a campaign or whatever, what actually comes out on billboards or TV is very, very different from what your original idea was. And I just, that didn't really sit well with me. It's a camel. You ever heard that before? No. Like, like um, a camel is a horse by committee. <laughs> 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 you know, like if, if, you, if you get like a board and to try to design a horse, they'd end up coming up with a camel. What? I'm going to start using that. You got it there, yeah. 10% though, can I get? I'm just going to Google camel horse analogy there it when is when i go home i won't yeah, remember it, i didn't but. make it up um <laughs> so this is this is a radio show um and a, and a television show but um i'm going to ask you to do something kind of hard how would you describe your work not just to people who haven't seen it but people who actually can't see it right now it's like uh everybody knows uh, knows roy lichtenstein mm-hmm. so these are kind of comic booky yeah they're like panels uh little glimpses into the lives of like these characters that are made up. Um, but it takes Roy Lichtenstein esque pop art approach and mixes it with South Asian diaspora culture. Um, so the idea is that, you know, instead of, so Roy Lichtenstein, instead of him being inspired by 1940s war comics, what if he just spent all day watching Indian soap operas? Mm-hmm. What would the result of that be? And it's kind of like uh, when you go on my page or when you look at the art, it's like uh, crying ladies, you know, very dramatic. And, you know, Roy Lichtenstein's version was, you know, I, I'd rather drown than call Brad. Um, the hate copy version of that would be I burnt the rotis, kill me now. You know, yeah. I don't want to get married yeah. to this guy. Um, things like that. So, so was there... What was that moment where you saw Roy Lichtenstein's work and you said, oh, yeah, that's – do you remember that first moment where you saw that and you thought, I, I think I can do something like that? Um, it was kind of it – was, it was weird because I was um, – you know, I've been drawing, like, my whole life. Um, and the biggest challenge for any, you know, illustrator, any artist is to find that style. And so I was trying to get into the mind space of somebody who had established that. You know, so when you hear Roy Lichtenstein, you go, right, pop mm-hmm. artist. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and so I was kind of doing my research and I was like, okay, well, how did he start that? How did that get established and whatever? And then, you know, I had the idea and I was like, what if that was something, um, that took inspiration from Indian soap operas? And I thought that was insanely hilarious. I was just like laughing the entire day and making these like aunties essentially that are crying about burning the rotis or like, um, yelling at other women to leave their husbands alone or whatever. Um, and little by little, it just kind of became my thing. So I just kept going at it. I just kept watching different soap operas, kind of looking into my own life and into my own family and kind of taking moments from my life as well and translating them into the comic book sort of style. And, and that's kind of the, the heart of your work right now. Yes. 
You'd say so. Yes. Yeah. And so you um, so you were born in Pakistan? Yes, I was born in Pakistan. When did you come over? <coughs> I came over to Canada in 2000. You were how old? Uh, I was nine years old. So uh, what was that like? Uh, t- tell me, um, what, like, what were you feeling about Canada before you moved over? Um, it's, uh, it's funny because I remember um, being in school on, on the last day and all the kids were like kind of huddling around me and they were very excited. And the one thing that we all kept, you know, sort of yelling about was that um, in Canada, teachers don't beat you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I sounds get, ideal, yeah. I would get my ass whooped every day in school in mm-hmm. Pakistan. So that was the one thing that was kind of a relief for me. So I was looking forward to teachers that did not hit you <laughs> yeah. um, if you, like, forgot, like, your homework at home or whatever for, like, any reason. Also, I thought everybody lived in igloos. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I genuinely believe that everybody in Canada lived in igloos, and I was so happy to live in an igloo. So you were excited to come over here and park into an igloo. And, yeah, and, yeah. like, go ice fishing. Yeah. Yeah. And then so you move here. You moved to the, G- the GTA, the greater Toronto area. Yes. Um, what, what was it uh, like first when you got here trying to fit in? I was just so distracted by the snow, to be honest with you. I was like, okay, it's not an igloo, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of snow, and this is cool, and I've never seen that before. So it was very like, you know, we were being kids, um, but we did move here a year before 9-11. So once that happened. Yeah. So like, what, what, like, what was the difference then? You said you moved here a year before 9-11. Yes. And then can you compare and contrast your, your pre-9-11 Canadian life and your post-9-11 Canadian life? So the pre was pretty small. It was like a year, you know, just trying to um, be friends with everybody and like, you know, get along with other kids. It's like the, you know, typical stuff. I mean... Um, there wasn't a huge language barrier for me because my brother and I, we both went to an English medium school in Pakistan. So we spoke English when we came here and we didn't really go to ESL or anything like that. But uh, we just tried to, you know, the same thing, you know, you try to fit in with like, you're new at school, you try to fit in with other kids. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't really uh, notice any sort of like tension or anything like that with other kids until... 2001 and then the beginning of 2002 where everything just got kind of hostile and I would hear these terms like packy being thrown around and I'd be like what does that mean like why you know kids certainly like they stopped talking to me all of a sudden um obviously the bullying started they were like name calling terrorists go back to your country things like that and at that time I was like I don't know what's going on is it my fault you know obviously I didn't watch the news as a kid so I had no idea why there was this shift, like everybody just started hating me. And so obviously as a kid, you just start taking it out on yourself. Yeah, you, so you, you, start, you, like, you blame yourself for it. Yeah, and then what happens um, is that you start stripping your culture little by little because it's getting, you know, your ass kicked every day. Like, you know, it's getting like, if something is leading to a child being bullied, that kid's going to do whatever they can to not get bullied. So um, I stopped sort of mentioning where I was from. I stopped talking about my culture. I stopped bringing like uh, Indian food to school. Like I told my mom, mom, don't pack me like kebabs. Like don't give me all this stuff. Like it smells like curry and kids bully me and this and that. So mm-hmm. little by little, these things just kind of like took over my life to the point where I was like caring too much about not seeming brown um, because I knew that that would hurt me. And, and, and what was the, we talked about a turning point earlier. Um, Maria Kumar, so much of your art that we're here to talk about today is re- does revolve around a South Asian identity. What was the turning point where you went from being ashamed of your heritage, ashamed of where you come from, ashamed of your family, mm-hmm. to, to embracing it? It's weird because um, up until, even up until like high school or, uh, you know, college, there was always this like, these weird microaggressions, like, oh, you're pretty for a brown girl. Oh, you don't, you know, you don't have an accent. Oh, you're like one of the good ones. Like these little things that really get to a person. And you're kind of raised hearing all these little things like, you know, you, what you, who you are is wrong. What you eat is disgusting. What you wear is weird. Your Bollywood music is, it, you know, you guys only watch that. Like, do you know what this means? Like, you know, little things like that to girls all of a sudden wearing bindis at Coachella. You know, Indian right. food not becoming a trend. Oh, I want chicken tikka masala. Oh, Maria, can you recommend some Indian restaurants in the neighborhood? You saw it become kind of cool. It's It started becoming the same things that we were being shamed for now started becoming trendy. 
And at that point, you kind of realize, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. So I wasn't, so that was your problem the entire time? That wasn't me? That was, you know? So that was kind of like, you, you, you take it back and you go, my whole life, the thing that I've been shamed for is now a trend. What does this mean for me? Was I really in the wrong? You know, then you kind of start realizing that now I have to go back and reevaluate my entire life and all my choices. That must have been such a such a, a sudden and an extreme kind of realization. It's it's pretty, you know, it, it's it, you know, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. That's the that's the only way to put it. Yeah. Um, and then you kind of have to relearn your culture all over again after forcefully being stripped of it for the purpose of assimilation. And that's kind of what the art kind of talks about or represents, right? What, it's do, you, like, what do you mean Rupa, that by that, that's what the art talks about or represents? Well, it kind of, it's like looking at Indian culture through the eyes of somebody who, you know, is full on assimilated in Western culture, but is still trying to embrace their Indianist, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, the, the art we're speaking about, by the way, is um, Hate Copy, the artwork of Maria Kumar, who's uh, my guest in studio right now, known to her almost 82,000 Instagram followers, by the way, as Hate Copy. And a lot of the art that you make centers around, as you man- mentioned, the aunties, um, the, the South, South Asian aunties. W- w- what can you tell me about them? Why them? The aunties... For me, aunties. Sorry, I'm, yeah. I'm, I got that real East Coast aunties thing going. It sounds like I'm just <laughs> aunties. So it sounds like I don't like something. I'm anti. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the aunties. Well, I grew up in a very like matriarchal home. Like I have a lot of aunties. There's a lot of um, feminine energy. But the aunties that are in the artwork are actually aunties that you will see on Indian soap operas or Pakistani soap operas or like Bollywood or whatever. It's these extreme hyperbolic characters that sort of make a big deal out of, like, very small things. Um, And that's a huge part of, like, what I grew up watching, what I grew up hearing as well, you know. um, You're 15, you know, time to get married. Oh, yeah. And it's like, what? (laughs) Too young for that. What's going on? Yeah. And I think, well, that was one of the pieces that I made as well, but as soon as I uploaded it, I thought it was just me that was going through all of it. Turns out it's a pretty common thing. And I had no idea until people started taking their friends in it. And I was like, oh, I guess aunties uh, have got to everybody. But what's, what's, what's that feeling like when you, when you make something that's really truly for yourself? And I truly, when I, when I look at your work, feel like it is. And then you see people comment. And that's the beautiful thing about Instagram is you see people say stuff like, me too. Or you mm. see them, all they do is just tag someone who, who they think gets it. Yeah. What, what's, what's that feeling like? It feels like we're all sharing one big inside joke amongst like a big family to me because my whole life I thought I was the only person that was going through all of it and you're right like anything that I put up even now I have no idea that anybody else feels this way um, and sometimes it gets me into a lot of trouble because there are some people that know that this piece is inspired by them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, right. I, I, read, I read a line with, from you that <laughs> you, you said, why your parents, uh, how do your parents feel about it? And you said, well, they can't say anything to me because if they do, it'll end up in the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll end up in the, in the comic. Uh, you know what? My mom said that multiple times. She's like, you know what? I want to say something to you right now, but I won't because it'll end up on the internet <laughs> and then you'll say bad things about me. I'm like, I don't say bad things about people. Only the truth. Um, anyway, go on. Sorry. But, um. Yeah, like there's even there's things about, you know, where's my ring? And, you know, the person that I'm seeing at the time would be like, is this about me? Like, what what's going on? Am I am I supposed to be a sheesh? And I'm like, ah, you know what? Can't say. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, everything's sort of mimicked. But that but that, that that criticism that can come from people you're thinking you're speaking directly about them. Um, I can't imagine that that everyone has been comfortable with your depiction of your life at all? I mean, how, how have you handled any kind of criticism coming from from the, the South Asian diaspora? Um, I'm very open to talk about things. Like, I'm... Ha- has it happened? Have people reached out? Um, no, I got an email today. Some guy was, like, yelling at me because I don't post every day. I don't know. But nothing critical of the content? Nothing critical of the, um, of the depictions? I mean, obviously, there's, you know, not everybody's going to relate to a thing. Uh, yeah. That's... You know, I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, there has been, I don't know about criticism. Like, it's more like, uh, you know, this doesn't really relate to my life or is irrelevant or whatever. 
That's kind of the nice thing about Instagram, though. You can choose. Yeah. You know, it's not like in the in the eighties and nineties where you you kind of had to watch the thing that was on TV. Yeah. If anything, you can you can seek out the things that relate to you. Exactly. And if you don't like something, you can just move on to the next uh, profile or whatever. I do. I know we mentioned them earlier, but I do want to talk about your folks. I do, I do want to talk about your parents. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, how did they feel originally when you told them you wanted to be an artist? Originally, it was very you know. Uh, it's not something that we talk about, like, you know, because my parents are both um, in the field of medicine. Um, and so they're very, you know, at first they were like, you know, you got to be a pharmacist or something like that. Um, doctor, lawyer, engineer. Something typical. Re- uh, quote unquote respectable. Uh, yeah. Something that's stable, something that, you know, brings in money. You can get on your own two feet, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and art was kind of more to them a hobby, um, which is understandable. I mean, back home I guess that's not really an option for a lot of people it's it's kind of the privilege of being in a country like Canada or America or the UK is that we have the privilege to to go on um and have these options to become artists or graphic designers or illustrators so at first they were like they they were like absolutely no because they had no idea what it was and you know that was even a field that people could excel in or go to school for um so I kind of finessed my way into advertising, which is a more corporate sounding creative field. So they would kind of, I feel bad, but I kind of tricked them into letting me go into a creative field (laughs) by using big words like, oh, brands and, you know, marketing and this and that content. Yeah. Yeah. And they're like, okay, it doesn't sound like anything artistic. So yeah, I guess you can do that. And, And now Maria Kamar, you have this Incredible following is Hey Copy again, like eighty-two thousand Instagram followers, and, and only growing. You'll gain at least thirty from us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how do they? How do they feel about it now? Um, it's it's still uh, it's still going to take some time. Yeah, uh, you know you can't change the mindset um, of somebody who's been doing something that has worked, you know, well for them, because their whole thing is you know they came to this country, they got a job, whatever job it was. Um, so they could get that stable income and provide for their family. And they've been in their field for over 35 years. So to change the mindset of somebody like that is is not going to take, you know, it's going to take longer than a year or two. It's going to be a process. Like what's the, what's the one thing you wish they understood about it? Um, I think it's the possibilities. It's the, it's the impact on culture. It's the discussion. Um, it's the fact that the arts – contributes to culture. It's basically what it is. You know, it starts a conversation about who we are um, as Daisies living in the West. You know, what does this mean for us? We're all dealing with the same sort of stuff together. We're all kind of in this together, even though there's a lot of us. But even just looking at, um, even if, even just looking at the Instagram, you know, there's a lot of people that are bonding over little moments like that. Yeah. Um, these conversations just need to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and Instagram's a, an interesting place to do it. I mean, you are in many ways kind of, and it's, it's a strange word to use, but kind of pioneering. I don't know if you ever think about that, but art, art, art on Instagram. I mean, in, in that you're the first kind of generation of people ever, ever to do it. As an artist, you know, what, what do you see as the most important distinction between putting your art on Instagram and putting your art in, a, say, a gallery? I, so I did not go to art school. I did not make those connections. Um, I did not know how to get into those circles, um, how to talk to a gallery owner, how to approach galleries, what a curator was. I had no idea about any of these things. I treated my Instagram as a gallery that was always open to me. Um, and even when you look at, you know, galleries in Ontario or galleries in Canada, a lot of the art that's featured is not from women of color. These are just statistics. These are just facts. So it's very difficult for a person like me to get into a gallery right off the bat, um, just talking about my inner turmoil or whatever. You know, it has to be, you have to know people to get in essentially. (laughs) And I had no idea. So yeah, I kind of treated Instagram as my gallery um, and I posted all my stuff up there for everybody to see um, and comment and sort of have those discussions. And then Eventually, that turned into a demand for the work, and when there's demand, galleries will come. And so uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with a bunch of galleries in Toronto that are, you know, very 
interested in carrying work that's different, that's kind of talking about things that, you know, your typical person won't really talk about, like DC culture and like, yeah. I, and, <laughs> and, and, and your art really does seem to be touching a huge slice of the South Asian uh, diaspora. And I love going in to look at the, and if you do, I, I, by the way, I know you're going to do it if you're listening to this right now, but go check it out. I mean, go go on Instagram. If you don't have it, ask your nephew um, and, and and go to Hate Copy. And, and, and after you look at the piece, which is, which is funny enough and which are brilliant enough, you'll go down and you'll just see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these comments, which are usually either me too or, oh, yeah, that's totally my mom or that's totally my aunt or that's totally me. Um, what, what are you, even though you make it for yourself, what are you hoping personally that your fans, the people who see these things, take away from your work? For me, every time I post something or every time I put something out, is the same thing as it was when I first posted um, any sort of art is I want to make my friends laugh. I want to make my friends sort of comment and talk about it with me, not necessarily relate because I don't know what anybody else is going through really. It's all kind of like a shock to me that people actually um, have gone through similar situations. So I'm kind of learning about people. I'm kind of learning about all these followers um, the same way they're learning about me. Um, my main goal for the for the Instagram and just in life in general is just to grow my skills as an artist. That's kind of, that's always been my only goal. So even if you look back at the first thing that I posted, which was like a doodle online paper to what I'm posting now, um, I experiment with different patterns, different shapes, different influences. And I kind of want people to notice that progression mm -hmm. and sort of follow along the journey with me. Maria, it's been a, a real treat talking to you today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming in and thanks for for driving up our Instagram numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.